and welcome to The Hot Seat. I'm Imogen Withers. I'm here with Harold Lasky Chair, Professor Simon Hicks, to talk about the implications of the EU referendum result. Welcome, Simon. Thanks. So, as the result of the EU referendum began to emerge, it was greeted with a certain amount of shock. Was the outcome a surprise, or should we have seen it coming? I think we should have seen it coming. I think it's been coming for quite a long time. Um, Britain has become increasingly isolated in the EU. Um, we're not in the euro, we're not in the Schengen free, tra- free uh, movement of people zone, um, and we've become incre- our government has become increasingly isolated in the council of ministers in terms of voting. So, I mean, it's been a long time coming. It wasn't clear that this was always going to be the outcome, but I think actually if you look at the polls closely, over the last two months of the campaign, we've seen 50% of polls showing a lead for Remain, 50% showing a, a lead for Leave. So I don't think people should have been quite as surprised as they were. And what do you think was the decisive issue that swung the result towards Brexit? I think there were three issues. There was, I think of them as the three I's, inequality, uh, immigration and income. So this kind of, um, so we've seen rising inequality in, in Britain, not just social inequality, but geographic inequality. Um, the, the other really big issue was immigration. So. Um, we, uh, immigration in general, we know, has been very good for the British economy, very, uh, you know, increasing our skills base, lowering, cost, lowering costs of production and so on. But there's been some big distributional effects that we haven't really addressed. So it's put a, immigration has put a lot of pressure on, on lower skilled wages in certain sectors, for example, in the agricultural sector. Um, it's also put pressure on local council housing and local services like healthcare and primary education. And, and so the governments, successive governments have not really address that issue and immigration has become a bigger issue because of an economic downturn and because of cuts in public spending. So that's a kind of very poisonous mix, growing inequality, cuts in public spending, economic downturn, mass immigration, and suddenly you have this upswell of of anti-establishment, anti-London, anti-European, anti-immigrant sentiment that has come back to bite us. There's been talk of buyer's remorse among some um, Leave voters since the result. Do you think people had enough information about the enormity of what was at stake? Yes, I mean, it's easy to kind of look at buyer's remorse, but actually the outcome was quite decisive. I mean, 52-48, the difference was 1.2 million voters. I mean, I think it's not so much of a shock that we voted to leave, it's quite a shock that it was such a big margin. 4% is quite a big margin. I think most people thought if we were going to vote to leave, it was going to be a very narrow margin. And in England and Wales, it was a very big margin. And in fact, some of the latest analysis shows that if you look across the Westminster constituencies, about 420 of those constituencies out of 650 had probably majority leave votes. So this is a pretty big margin. So yes, people might have buyer's remorse now, but the people, the number who do have that buyer's remorse, I don't think in any way would have changed the outcome. The fallout has been huge in UK politics, with Cameron resigning, the Labour Party split and a potential second Scottish referendum on the cards. Is the UK now more politically divided than ever? I think it is more politically divided. I think this was coming anyway, and it's a sort of, it's an earthquake in British politics. It's going to take us many years, perhaps decades, for this earthquake, for us to really see the effects of this earthquake down the pipe. So we don't know whether there's going to be a split in the Labour Party. If Corbyn wins again as the leader, I could imagine a new party emerging and a split there. We don't know if the Labour Party, if there's an early election, is going to lose a lot of seats to UKIP. We don't know whether the Conservative Party is going to turn out to be a far more populist and anti-immigration right-wing party or move to be more centrist. There's a real fight going on there. There could well be a second referendum in Scotland. I think it's not clear yet that Nicola Sturgeon could win that. We don't know what's going to happen to Northern Ireland. There could be a referendum in Northern Ireland about whether there's unification with the Republic. We could be looking back 10 years from now and say, well, it was a good thing we did that. We're now no longer in the EU. We're freer to trade with the world. We, have a very, we still are a very open liberal society. We still have a very open liberal economy. And actually, the economy has started to pick up. And we've got new free trade agreements with the rest of the world. And British politics has stabilized. That's one kind of positive scenario. And, and I wrote a piece for the LSE blog saying that down the line, what we should be looking for is Britain to have a relationship with the rest of the EU, like the relationship between Canada and the United States. It's a kind of positive narrative. But I can imagine also a disaster scenario. I can imagine meltdown between the political parties, 
um, chaos in, in, uh, after a, a, another general election where a government is difficult to form, Scottish independence, crisis in Northern Ireland, and perhaps even social unrest with the real anger that has sort of come out of nowhere against immigrants that I think a lot of people didn't realise there was this pent-up anti-immigrant feeling in large parts of the country that we're now seeing. So it's big uncertainty, and it's the uncertainty that I think is the real damage for the economy. And it appears as if there wasn't a concrete plan in place of the event of voting to leave the EU and confusion at the moment seems to be reigning. How long could negotiations take? Will the UK actually go through with it? And is there a possibility of a second referendum in future, as some are suggesting? There's lots of issues to unpack there. The first one is uh, what happens now. I think it's a bit unfair to say to the Leave campaign, you know, where's your plan? This wasn't about having a plan. This was about making the choice and then working out afterwards what the options were. So I think it's a little unfair. Um, in terms of what happens now, the big question is when does Britain press the Article 50 button? Article 50 in the EU treaty is the article that starts the negotiations on exit. Once a member state has notified the other member states, it's a two-year negotiation. But that negotiation is really just a withdrawal negotiation. That's not a negotiation for deciding what happens afterwards. And so they will negotiate there the terms of withdrawal, for example, rights of EU citizens in the UK, rights of UK citizens on the continent, payments into the budget, and so on. What happens afterwards, for example, whether the UK goes into the European economic area, like Norway, or whether there's a new free trade agreement between the EU and the UK, that would have to be done under a different article in the treaty, which would require unanimous agreement of all the other member states and domestic ratification in all the other member states, which could probably trigger referendums in France, the Netherlands, Denmark, who knows where. So although it's a two-year clock for this withdrawal negotiation, a long-term settlement between the UK and the EU could take a really long time, could take five, six, seven, eight years, because of the length of time it would take to agree and then ratify, and it could easily be derailed in that process. EU leaders have said that there can be no access to the single market without free movement of labour. Considering the Leave campaign promised to cut immigration, is this something they can realistically deliver? And what might any Brexit deal look like? Really good question. I mean, that's exactly at the heart of what we're, think, what we're, we're, we're grappling with right now. I think uh, the Leave campaign were sending the type of message that we can have our cake and eat it. They said if we leave the EU, financial services, creative industries, manufacturing, we'd still be able to trade without any borders or any disruption in the EU single market. Um, that's very different to free trade. A free trade agreement just says we agree not to have tariffs, but that's only good for goods. That's not so good for services. Services require on common rules about how the market works. And so uh, most free trade agreements don't cover much of services. And we're a service economy. So as a service economy, we really need to have access to that single market. But the EU, quite rightly, now says the single market is about four freedoms. Freedom of movement of capital, goods, services, and people. And the, the key link is between services and people. Because to have a single market in services, you have to have free movement of people. Because a service economy is, after all, people. And so that's going to be the real tricky negotiation. Is it possible for Britain to leave the EU, perhaps move into something like the EEA, like Norway, and negotiate some limits on free movement of people? Right now, I think I wouldn't say that's an impossible outcome. Norway has to accept free movement of people. Switzerland has to accept free movement of people. But Britain is a much bigger economy than those two. Britain would be the EU's largest external trading partner. So I think it does have a bit more leverage. And so I can imagine a special arrangement where there are some caps on the movement of people. But I don't know whether that would be enough to satisfy the people who thought they were voting to leave, voting to leave the EU so they could really bring down immigration and perhaps even reduce immigrant numbers and throw people out. And how will EU members be feeling about the referendum result? Has the UK irreversibly damaged its relationship with the rest of Europe? I think immediately after the referendum, there was a real sense of schadenfreude in several, lots of capitals and amongst the people across Europe. And I mean, a lot of cheering across of Europe when England was kicked out of the European Football Championships. Um, but that schadenfreude, I think, will go quickly. Uh, you know, I think the rest, you, you, Europe feels that it is quite socially and economically integrated. Britain is part of Europe, part of the European economy. Um, a lot of it will depend on what kind of messages come from the new leadership here in Britain. And I think the, we think the rest of Europe thinks of us as partners. We're partners, we're part of the same European family of nations. We've got a lot of collective economic and security interests together. And so there is a sense that we need to get through this as quickly as possible. 
in the best economic and security interests of both Britain and the rest of Europe. And I think that goodwill will be where we're starting from. That goodwill might be tested very quickly, though, and that's what, that could be the danger. Simon, thank you very much. You're off the hot seat. Thank you.